so I'm so happy and just excited for y'all. Thank you so much for coming to the event. Um, so I'm just going to start with a brief introduction of um, Alan Tirishiano. So now in his 30th year on the University of California Irvine faculty, Alan Tirishiano is a professor of dance and associate dean for undergraduate affairs for the Claire Trevor School of the Arts. Woohoo. Educated at Yale University in the Eastman School of Music, Alan is professionally active as a composer for choreography, the theater, and the concert hall, having created over 150 original scores over his professional career. Collaborators have included Minnesota Orchestra, Northwestern University's New Music Ensemble, New Swan Shakespeare Festival, and choreographers including Colin Connor, David Grenke, Liz Lerman, Donald McHale, Doug Nielsen, and Jeff Slayton. In 2000, he won the grand prize in Quebec's Festival d'Arts de saint Sevier International Competition for original composition for choreography with his work, Blue Motions for String Quartet, recorded most recently on the Phasma Music label. In April 2011, Northwestern University premiered his harp concerto, The Parting Glass, with Aaron Pontelfrand as harp soloist. In the summers of 2014 through 18, he wrote the incidental music for the New Swan Shakespeare Festival's productions of A Midsummer, Night, Midsummer Night's Dream, As You Like It, Twelfth Night, and Macbeth. More, more recently, he has collaborated with organist David Lobal, composing Mission Cassini, which premiered in 2019 at the Southwest Regional American Guild of Organists Convention. And in 2021, Voices in the Quiet Cathedral, a meditation on the COVID-19 pandemic, its impact on all of our cultures. His newest recording, Other Dances, Other Songs, has just been released on the Phasma record label. As a pianist, he has performed his own compositions as well as repertoire ranging from Bach to Frederick Jepsky in choreographic settings throughout the US and Europe and in Asia, including C City Center in New York with the Alvin Eiley American Dance Theater, the Sojourn Center for the Performing Arts in Seoul, Korea, the Paris Conservatoire, the Joyce Theater in New York, the Ford Amphitheater in LA, and the Carpenter Performing Arts Center in Long Beach, California. In 2006, Terry Shano was named Orange County's Outstanding Individual Artist of the Year, 2005, by the organization Orange Arts Orange County. So thank you so much, y'all, and please let me pass this to Alan Terry Shano. Hello. Ah. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. I apologize for the delay from getting up to the chair being here. Um, today's comments, I ended up choosing to write them. Uh, and I will deliver them, but I just won't be reading them directly. So I'll be wandering over here every now and then to look at the piece of paper. Uh, but uh, I did feel the need to kind of uh, coordinate my thoughts and make sure I speak uh, what I want to say in the way I want to say it. So I really did need to think this through. Uh, so first of all, thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, I will read this to make sure I get it right. I wish to at first express my deepest gratitude to Jonathan Fang, Claire Yu, Deborah Nielsen, Elizabeth Beach, and Isabella Cow and all of the organizers of this series for this opportunity. I wish to thank uh, Lisa and Anthony and my family uh, for their support, patience, and their tolerance. Uh, and I wish to express my delight and my uh, deepest gratitude that you all actually showed up to hear this. And I'm, I'm really marveling at that. Um, that you are even here fills me with wonder, which is one of my key words for the day. And I will confess to a touch of stage fright. Okay. Even now I have talked in front of people for a very long time at this point. So when I was asked to be a speaker for the series, I was at once extraordinarily flattered and at the same time unsure how to proceed. Uh, these comments that you're about to hear today are really uh, charting 
the process by which I came to land on something for today's talk. And, uh, and really, it's a journey where I've undertaken to try to decode the title, What Matters to Me and Why, in some sort of meaningful way, at least for me. And at the outset, I wish to express uh, a discomfort. And that discomfort is that the nature of this presentation today requires a large amount of self-interrogation. And, you know, I love to talk about myself, but I think right now in the world today, it's really important that our, our focus be outward. So uh, I really feel that it's incumbent upon me that the navel gazing you're about to hear, uh, I, I feel responsible that I turn the focus back out. And so I will do so toward the end of, of the talks because I just don't think that this kind of self-absorption that I'm feeling in presenting all this to you uh, alone is that meaningful. Okay, so about myself, I know that I have a sense of humor, but I also have uh, this kind of earnest side to myself that is, uh, can be almost grinding at times. And I do think that earnest streak in me uh, has made this commission a lot more challenging than it really needed to be. What does matter to me? How ex existential do I want to take this? Um, I really worried about that. How can I possibly offer anything profound or inspiring? Well, I want to share an insider tip to all of you. Uh, you get some instruction when you are asked, tapped to make this presentation. And one of the best pieces of advice in the instruction was that uh, you should share a story about overcoming personal adversity. Uh, I think the, by doing so, I think that stories of personal adversity and overcoming them are inspiring and they're relatable. We all have to do it. Um, I don't have any argument with that. I completely agree. And so my problem is that all of my adversity was self-inflicted. And so I not sure about the inspiration part. So let me tell you a story. For example, I was a first year college student since I was outed as a Yale student, I'll just say. I was a fre freshman, a first year at Yale. Uh, and I, in addition to the piano, I played clarinet. I got into the marching band, which was called the Yale Precision Marching Band. And the Yale Precision Marching Band was infamous for somewhat obscene halftime shows and all sorts of things like that. But the, the incident I'd like to share with you had to do with uh, the band always had little offshoots. And one of the offshoots, this was New Haven, Connecticut, which was very Italian. So we had a Columbus Day parade in New Haven, Connecticut. And, and I went to high school in Connecticut. So I marched in Columbus Day parades for since junior high. And so, yeah, I want to do that. Uh, and so it was volunteer, and, we, and I volunteered to do this. And, um, and we were going to march in New Haven, Connecticut's Columbus Day Parade. All right, are you inspired yet? All right, so I had to wear roller skates to participate in this particular event. Are you inspired now? <laughs> All right. All right, yeah, wow, Alan, that's courageous. Now, it's also true that I had never worn roller skates in my life, okay? If you're inspired by that, I don't know if you should be. So, let me make sure I get the details of this right. Okay, so when we approached the grandstand, which was on the green in New Haven, which is a beautiful green, by the way, on that grandstand was the mayor of the city of New Haven, the president of Yale University, and the uh, congressional representative to the US House of Representatives from my, that region of Connecticut, and about 20 other people of some import. 
Okay, so at that point, uh, it turns out that little road in front of the grandstand is actually, it goes a little downhill. <laughs> and um, it always looked flat to me up to that day. And the uh, band pulled away from me. And there I was all alone in front of the grandstand. Okay, and I proceeded. So this was the first time I'd ever ro had roller skates on in my life. It was also the first time I'd ever done a split. I did it in front of the grandstand by myself and ripped my pants from here up to the belt loop back here. Are you inspired now? Okay. Would it help if you knew that that was the first standing ovation I ever got in my life? Okay. So, uh, you know, and I do know there was a bit of schadenfreude in that crowd. You know, oh, look what happened to the Yaley. Uh, so uh, I managed to come back. Oh, by the way, by then, the band hated me because all along the way, I'm falling and grabbing anything and anybody who's next to me. So they were all like, everybody was really quiet and no one asked how I was doing, even though I was covered in bruises. It was good to be 18. Okay, so anyway, I'll read this next part here. So I was vexed about this assignment. I was overwhelmed by a feeling that I did not have anything of substance to offer. The personal adversity path wasn't going to cut it. So I watched the archives of almost every presenter. Uh, and I found it very moving and very inspiring. Um, and the mantra of it really became clear to me, just be yourself. But somehow I still wasn't comforted by that. Uh, you know, and I watched my uh, colleagues share their journeys. I was so moved to tears by some of them, their courage, their selflessness. They're, everybody's so smart, and so honest, so thoughtful and unique. I felt plagued by the need to know that what matters to me would matter to you. I really was plagued by this. So all I can say is thank God for the Barbie movie. Which, when you get right down to it, lands on the message that you need to figure out what matters to you and why. It was the punchline of the movie. Uh, and, and I don't say this trying to make fun of this uh, request to speak or this series. I don't feel that way at all. It, but it calmed me down tremendously. Uh, it gave me a fresh perspective. That question is challenging. Everybody's doing it. And if a doll can solve this, then I can too. Um, also, there was an Allen doll, which I thought was really cool. And the Allen doll <laughs> was unique. Okay. So I started my preparations by keeping a What Matters to Me journal. And the journal, uh, I really took it literally. I decided at various points during the day for about a week, I would just uh, ask myself, well, what matters to you right now? And I would record them. Uh, most of the responses, if not completely shallow, had more to do with my primate self than uh, anything else. So let me read you several samples of these. Uh, the time and the location, as well as the what mattered to me at that moment. I'll begin with a 3 a.m. in bed. What mattered to me is wondering, if I get out of bed right now, can I fall asleep again? At 5.30 a.m. in the kitchen, not eating breakfast, what mattered to me was, I'd like to eat breakfast right now. At 10.47, talking to a friend in the hallway, if I can scratch my back right now, if I can't scratch my back right now, I will go insane. I actually waited till the conversation was over and then scratched my back and then wrote that down. Uh, 11.53, I think I was in my car, but this could have been anywhere on the planet. My, what mattered to me was lunch. Uh, at 2.07 in my living room, it, uh, what mattered to me is where I put my keys. At 3.30 in class, I wondered, how much more time do I have left in my class? And at 5 o'clock, somewhere in University Hills, will the dogs notice if I cut the walk a little short today? Okay, this is just a, a set of, I say there were about 40 to 50 of these, uh, and I'll probably never share them with anybody, but that gives you kind of a sampling of what they are, and I would say they're pretty disappointing. 
Um, I also found myself falling down the middle of the night well of terror, which is where you lay awake worrying about deadlines, you worry about loved ones, you worry about sickness, you worry about the evil in the world, you worry about potential danger, all of those things that, you know, rationally the odds are it's not going to hit you at 3 o'clock in the morning while you're laying there in bed, but you still stare at the ceiling doing that. That didn't help me. But scattered in those very dull and self-absorbed little thoughts were occasional moments where I just, without even thinking about it self-consciously, I was just wondering what was going on with somebody. Or I was wondering how something worked. And I was, let me see how I put it. I was wondering about music. I was wondering about art. I was wondering about, how did somebody do that? That was really cool. I wondered about natural phenomena. We just had a, an eclipse. I thought about that. And I kept thinking, isn't it amazing that on this planet, the moon and the sun turn out to have the same diameter disk, apparently? And so we get an eclipse, which is probably really unusual. Sometimes it just was puzzle solving in my head. Um, Thus it has ever been for me. I want to know how it all works. I want to know what's wrong. I want to know how another human can make something so miraculous as a work of art, an elegant proof, a transformative medication, a delicious meal, or a funny joke. Why do I want to know these things? Many reasons, I think. I can't stand missing out, first of all. I'm, a, I'm the youngest child. So that comes with the territory. I want to be able to do these things myself. I want that. I want to do it. I want to be able to have fun with you, because I, so I need to know how to fix your bad mood. Um, the list, I think, is endless, and I could give you lots of those. So I want to now, at this point, circle back to the title of the series, What Matters to Me and Why. I understand now that I wasted a lot of time looking outside of myself for the answer. And I don't, these comments are only directed at me. I just want to be clear about that. I know to be true that it matters to me that I do the right thing, that I live a consistently ethical life, and that I not intentionally hurt someone else in any way. But on its own, a code of ethics is essentially proscriptive. It's a set of things that you're like, you should do these things. What I really want, and what really matters to me, is to find a path to empathy where the ethics are a natural outcome. And that path for me is my own curiosity. It's my own ability to wonder. What matters to me and why is a difficult question because I think the what for me does not refer so much to an object, a person, or an idea. Over time, these things will inevitably change in your life. But it refers to a mode of being. So I'd like to reframe what matters to me and why as, who am I when I am at my best? Or more simply put, what is my best self and why? So what is my best self? I've kind of already said it, but I'll just circle back to the idea. For me, it would be my curious nature. I think this is my best self. I think this is what matters to me. And what really matters is that I honor my capacity for wonder that I have always possessed. So let's drill down on these two words. Wonder to me is emotional and almost physiological response to an unknown or an unexpected thing. I also see it as a positive. There are other responses we can have to an unknown and unexpected thing. Dread, fear, all those things. Wonder is a positive one. And it perhaps is irrational. It may be just purely a, a chemical response in the brain. Uh, it is the engine that inspires curiosity. It's more distance methodical partner. And curiosity evokes the will to action that is its central power. 
Okay, so granted, it, I've just started teaching this course on improvisation, and, and we've been talking about cognitive science. And we learned about the executive functions, which children learn at a very early age. So if you don't have fully developed executive functions, such as a working memory, inhibition control, and cognitive flexibility, the ability to shift what we're talking about because something came out of left field, uh, curiosity can definitely lead you to trouble. Not everyone wants you in their business. Curiosity can, you, can absolutely distract you from the task at hand that you need to get done. Um, oh, look at that picture. That's really interesting. So I do wish to act out what happens when I'm supposed to be telling you what these ideas and instead I got distracted by the picture. This has been my inner war for my entire life. Um, curiosity can be really annoying. Uh, and it's really interesting when I have a student who just relentless, relentlessly asks me questions. I'm like, stop so I can finish. You know, it's like, no, no, you have to, you have to also guide that student so they're not driving the rest of the students crazy. You know, you have to, you have to funnel the energy, but you don't want to shut it down. And I was that kid, so I can't, I can't in good conscience, like, shut it down. So, if it's well administered, curiosity has tremendous power. And these are the powers that I think curiosity has. Curiosity transcends fear. Curiosity transcends boredom. I can honestly say, even though I have spent hours playing stupid games on my phone, that I've never actually been bored. And curiosity really is wonderful at transcending isolation and despair. Curiosity gets you out of yourself. I've occasionally been obsessed with curiosity. A few years back, I really, really needed to know how a sewing machine worked. Because I couldn't figure it out by looking at it. And I finally found this wonderful animation that showed up. I was like, it was such a relief. Oh, by the way, I don't sew. Um, when I was a child, I still remember this very vividly, I took apart the lawnmower, and when I put the lawnmower back together, there was this extra part that hadn't been there before. And the best part was that the lawnmower still ran. So naturally, what do you think I did? I took the lawnmower apart again, because I had to figure out where that part went. And uh, I'd love to say that I ended up with two parts, but uh, actually I figured out what I'd done wrong. Okay, so when I started here at UCI, in order to compensate for my own imposter syndrome, which every faculty member has to navigate, I promised myself I would ask a question at every meeting, lecture, or presentation that I attended. Uh, and it turned out that I didn't need to like, kick myself to do it. I just really always ended up having a question. Uh, I also knew that there was power in being able to be completely upfront about how ignorant I was or how confused I was about something. Uh, and, and I would ask it. I love when, you know, after the meeting, when the meeting was over, somebody would come up to me and go, say, I'm so glad you asked because I didn't understand it either, you know. So it becomes a habit. I engaged in service on this campus a lot. Uh, I have been the chair of two different departments. I have been the chair of the Senate. I have been the chair of the Council on uh, Academic Personnel. I've been, and, and I'm not trying to read you my resume. I just that I've just been immersed. But why? I wanted to know how things worked. I wanted to know who was making the decisions that affected me. And I especially wanted to know how I could change things that made no sense at all. And bureaucracy is that just comes with a bureaucracy. So I, did, I, can, I can honestly say power had very little to do with any of it. I hated that part of it. But I was not going to stand just saying, oh, OK, I'll just do that, if it made no sense to me at all. And I found that I'm much more effective working within a system than from without. Um, if there were anything positive that I could say about the COVID lockdown, 
And it's a struggle. And there were some other presentations, by the way, that spoke so eloquently about COVID when it was so much more immediate. Uh, I think about it and I marvel at it and I think that, thank God I'm not doing it now. I don't miss it. But I understood that I had a job because I was a teacher, not because I was a composer, not because I was a pianist, not because of any of that, because I was a teacher. And I, it really made me zero in on what does this mean? What does this mean for me? And here's where I landed. And I'd say this is kind of recent for me. Uh, teachers should be, or I should be, an agent for inspiring wonder. If I have gotten a student to be curious about something, I have done my job. It is a good thing to be curious and wonder about the world, to answer the what's that we wonder about. It is a good thing to be curious about how things work, the how. It is a good thing to question the rules, the sources, and the design of human systems, the why. It is a good thing to be curious about myself, my loved ones, my classmates, my teachers, my students, my leaders, perfect strangers, the who. So I will um, wind this, these comments down at this point. And so to say, that I have always been nosy. And what I am most curious about is that last item, uh, other people's stories. I love hearing other people's stories. I love stories. Stories have real power. Why else would someone, some people feel the need to ban books? You don't want those stories told. It's all about that. It's the stories. So during the COVID lockdown, I would see into the kitchens, the garages, the closets, the living rooms, the front hallways of all of my students all through that little Zoom window and all the things behind that. Um, you can be sure that I really, really wanted to know their stories, especially with all those wonderful artifacts right there in play. Like, what's, why is that? You know, I couldn't get enough of that. In fact, there was one student who in their first year was taking my freshman course or first year course, Music for Dance, uh, and they were taking it in Nebraska. And they always took the class sitting at a kitchen table. And so I introduced every beginning of a class as, welcome to another episode of the Kitchens of Nebraska. <laughs> and, and I think she appreciated it. I don't think she felt like I was teasing her, but she would always laugh. And then she started always changing an object or moving something, something like that. So it turned into a game. Okay, so here's the point that I need to circle out in a way uh, from the navel-gazing. Oh, there's a great word for navel-gazing, by the way, uh, called omphaloskepsis, which uh, I try to work it into conversation, but it never seems to land. So, <laughs> so I've given up, but I still like that word, omphalos and skepsis, together and make a wonderful idea. Um, I think that right now, in the world we are currently living in, the role that our individual and collective stories have is crucial to our moving forward in the world. It's never mattered more that we need to and want to hear each other, particularly when narratives contradict and compete what is the path that will lead away from violence and towards peace? I don't have much real wisdom to share about world events, except to say that without some way to be able to hear the stories we do not wish to hear and to consider them, I believe that peace will be forever elusive and our planet continually compromised. So your curiosity is, your, is the engine for me, for me anyway, for uh, looking at all this. I need to know the stories. I need to hear it. And I also need the, uh, uh, the skills to know when people are lying and then how to filter and all of those other things that go along with it. I'd like to close with an anecdote. 
Um, I don't know if this will inspire you or not, but it's, it was moving to me. So this, on August 1st, 2020, when we were four months in to COVID land, <clears throat> I received a message on Messenger, of all things, in Facebook, where I only usually get, you've just spent $4 on PayPal, is the only message I ever get in Messenger. But it was from a student who had graduated in 2006. I'm going to read part of it to you. And it's a little embarrassing. I don't think I've shared this with anybody. And, I, and I, it's a little embarrassing to read. Hi, Alan. I hope you are well. It's been a really long time since the last time we spoke, but you've always been one of my all-time favorite people. That's embarrassing. I'm writing to you because I have been meaning to do so for over 15 years now. I wanted to tell you all these years, thank you. Thank you for being there for me when I was dealing with severe anxiety and depression. You may or may not remember that during my last year at UCI, 2005-2006, I suffered from severe depression and self-harming thoughts. One day, outside of the music building, you stopped me and asked me if I was okay, and that you were there if I ever needed anything or anyone to talk to. I didn't really talk to you about it but you saw that there was something wrong and you reached out. Knowing that there was something, someone who cared about me paved the long way to recovery. I'm still dealing with anxiety and occasional relapses of depression, but nothing like those years. So I want to thank you for caring to ask, for just being there when I thought nobody was, when I couldn't think clearly, and when there was so much going on in my life, but felt like no one was really there for me. And the letter goes on. It's a very long message that talks about what they're doing now and catching me up and all of this stuff. So obviously I was a little shaken. I was so moved by that. And if you think that I am sharing this with you to make you think, wow, what a great person Alan is, I'm actually not. I actually remember that conversation. And I don't see myself as having done any heavy lifting here to... In, uh, to, I don't know, intervene on someone else's emotional health. I saw, I remember the expression on their face, and I remember thinking, what's going on? And it's just stopping them and asking them that. And they were startled. I remember them being startled and saying, I'm fine. And saying, okay, you know, I'm here. I'm happy to talk if you need it. Um, I'm also willing to go out on a limb here and suggest, and I don't know this for sure, that no one in the room has ever received an email saying that began with, I wanted to thank you for that time you just kept walking on by. Okay. And it's, there are probably moments when they're so relieved that you just kept walking on by, but you're not going to get that email. Okay. So what made me talk to her? Curiosity. I wondered. I was like, what's going on? I was outside of myself, which I think is the best thing about curiosity. It gets you outside of your own head in a way. Just, I want to know. Um, as a naturally introverted person who compensates, some people are surprised when I say that, but I know that I'm very introverted. I know that I've also probably kept on walking more often than I should have. But if I have anything else to share with any of you today, it's just that what matters to me is that I stay connected to the world and I stay interested in the world. It has helped me. Uh, it has made me a better teacher. It has made me a better colleague. It has made me a better friend and life partner. Uh, and so that is my message. That is what matters to me. That is why. I am really honored that you're here uh, today. If anybody wants a door prize, <laughs> I brought in a bunch of my CDs. So, and they're free. Uh, <laughs> I'm just trying to get rid of them. Uh, <laughs> but... I hope that was of some value to you, and, and, and please believe me when I say that was a long journey to get to this place. 
So thank you for your time and attention. And I guess it's question answer time. How, how does this work? I think I have to turn the button back on. All right, thank you so much, um, Alan Tiriciano. And that was such a moving and awesome story. So it's time for question and answers. Um, we're gonna use two microphones here. So anyone have any questions? All right, I saw your hand go up first. So. Oh, I just have a comment. Alan, I've known you since I came here. We have many things in common, but I did not know you were a fellow clarinetist. So let me tell you, this man keeps opening up like an onion. <laughs> Thank you. I still own a clarinet, but I can't be sure that I can play it anymore. Uh, very nice talk, very inspiring. Uh, in fact, I was inspired to ask a question you know, because you're always supposed to ask a question, especially a question that maybe everybody wants the answer to. Uh, and I was at the same time working on my executive functions and making sure I inhibit properly my impulses. <laughs> but my question involves uh, the Columbus Day Parade in New Haven, Connecticut. <laughs> the thing that I think everybody wants to know, I certainly want to know, is there any chance at all that that incident is on videotape? <laughs> Uh, I think it's a nightly prayer of thanks that this happened before. If somebody filmed it, who knows? It would have been a, like a Super 8 camera. This would have been October of 1979. So uh, I'm sorry. No, you're not. And I have and I have no intention of recreating the moment. So I have a question. Thank you very much for that very nice talk. I'm curious about, can you give us a little about your background, where you grew up? How is it you got interested in music? Uh, a little of that. Sure. Uh, I am, I grew up in a solidly middle-class Italian neighborhood in Bridgeport, Connecticut, Trumbull, Bridgeport area. Uh, my father was a banker. Um, and and my mother, was, I had essentially grew up in a Swedish Italian household, which was quite fun uh, and interesting. And I can see in my personality elements of my father and elements of my mother. Music was always around, and my dad loved music. And I just and a friend of mine sister played the piano, and I thought I want to do that. I was about eight, and so I asked. And my grandmother gave me I guess her little spinet. And we moved it over to our house, and I started taking piano lessons. And it was just something I did, but I really did enjoy it. And, and the thing that I think was really bad for me was that at first it was really easy. And I just never had to practice. I could just play this stuff. And then suddenly it wasn't. And I had no tools to overcome these problems. So I really had to kind of... Uh, break all that down. But I became a fairly good pianist. Uh, and it starts to enter into your identity in a weird way. And I really drank the Kool-Aid about classical music and this is the future and all of that. Uh, and then I had some very opening kinds of arts experiences. Uh, and it's, it's really useful to go to college and then you meet people who are better than you. And that really kind of gives you more perspective and and you have to decide whether that's going to kill you or it's going to make you better and and so i was playing uh piano and i played clarinet in the concert band and the marching band and then um i was working at a summer arts program and it was integrated with all the other art forms so i was like one of my fellow counselors was a dancer and i was being asked to play music for repertoire for dance to somebody when I got back to my senior year of college and they told me, oh, the Yale School of Drama is looking for a dance accompanist. I'd never actually accompanied a dance class in my life. So I showed up and I was absolutely horrible because I didn't understand that I was supposed to improvise. And so 
I'd love a recording. More than falling and splitting my pants on the Columbus Day Parade, I'd love a recording of my very first dance class. That would both just be a, a horror show. Uh, but, that, but they didn't fire me because this person insisted on live music and there was nobody. So I was doing it. And then I went to graduate school in a field that I realized there is a limit to curiosity. And when I was in a PhD program in music theory, I discovered my limit to curiosity, unfortunately. Meanwhile, I was playing for dance classes. And, and then the choreographers started asking me for a composition. Um, and I was having a great time. And I still wasn't thinking of it seriously. And then uh, I kept getting work. Uh, in the dance world. I was a musician for American Dance Festival. I, was, I learned how to improvise. Dance made me a much better musician than I would have been otherwise. And I met Donald McHale, who was a faculty member here at the American Dance Festival, and he essentially recruited me here. And so I am forever grateful to Donald for launching this really, really fun career. Uh, where I get to do all sorts of things. I teach in the music department, I play for class, I compose for choreographers, you know, and, uh, and I love UCI because I'm always able to, if, if, if I have an idea for something that I'd like to teach, I usually find a path to get there. And so it's always been a great, this has been an incredible good fortune for me as an artist to have landed here. Great, thank you. Are there other questions? Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful talk. I am also a clarinetist, and like you, I'm also not sure what sound would come out of it if I played today. Um, I'm coming from the science and engineering side of campus, and so I'm curious, um, I'm curious about you as a naturally curious person, if this curiosity has driven you to collaborate well outside of the arts and humanities span. And if you find inspiration in things like science and nature and how that guides your work as an artist. Absolutely. Uh, so um, in two ways. One is that, you know, the, the other thing about service on this campus is you're going to meet people you never would have met before. And you're going to meet people in the sciences who you just click with and they're interesting and you get interested in what they're doing. Uh, I would like to collaborate more uh, across uh, the campus than I, I get around to. Uh, but the other way is really interesting. As a kid, I loved astronomy more than anything. I was going to be an astronaut. I didn't care that I was nearsighted. I was still going to be an astronaut. I couldn't get enough of that. And that never, that never went away. So she mentioned, where's my introducer? Right okay. here. You mentioned a piece in 2019, an organist asked me to compose a piece for them. And I wrote a suite of pieces about the Cassini mission. And it, the huge journey, you know, it was in, en route as long as it was uh, there in, at Saturn. And, and I talked, and I wrote pieces about the moons, I wrote pieces about the rings, I wrote, and I collected it into this, organ piece. And, and I think that if I really had to say, use the word wonder as an adult, I would say astronomy still gives me that sense of wonder. Like just that sliver of a moon after the eclipse just two days ago, I just stopped and I stared at it for a while. So yes, I, I think that um, uh, mathematical relationships uh, that are manifest in uh, uh, astronomical mechanics, uh, uh, that really, excites me. I did a wonderful piece with Donald McHale uh, about um, Huntington's disease, where we com collaborated with one of the previous uh, speakers, as a matter of fact, it was her, uh, uh, Leslie Thompson, was uh, is a Huntington's disease researcher. And we used slides, and we used the Human Genome Music Project, and we did all of that. And we focused on um, Woody um, the folk singer, uh, Guthrie, Woody Guthrie, who had Huntington's disease and had been a close friend of Donald McHale's. And so he, uh, he took a dancer who could really do that kind of contortion. We actually studied, we brought in people with Huntington's disease. We studied their movement. We built it into the dance. I built the score uh, as a deterioration of Woody uh, Guthrie. Um, 
So those are some examples of it, but absolutely, that stuff, it just, it's so interesting. And I read, and, and my wife will attest to this, I read uh, low complexity uh, uh, science books all the time. You know, I, I, I struggle with it when it gets a little too complex, but, but history of science, natural science, I love to read that. Great. Thank you very much. I think in light of the hour, we probably should end at this point. But I'd like to thank Alan again for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you.